making implicit things explicit, how you can model developer norms and tools. And, uh, and obviously, you're now about to become very good at everything. But this is not true. I just find that people really enjoy seeing this slide before a talk because it makes them feel like they made the right decision being here. <laughs> so yes, hi, I'm Erin Keen. And I am a developer advocate uh, at IBM on the San Francisco City team. And yes, I am jet lagged. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and I also uh, run wordinc.com, which as Matt said, is the uh, biggest online dictionary by number of words, not by number of visitors. Um, and it has an open API. And in the last couple of years, I've gone from being a full-time lexicographer who does DevRel for the WordDoc API on the side to being a full-time developer advocate who does lexicography on the side. And one thing I learned by making that transition is that actually developer advocates and lexicographers are both concerned with the same thing. And that is, what do people know? So basically, when you're creating instructional material, whether that's a dictionary definition or a tutorial, you're thinking, what does my audience know? And what do they need to know? And essentially, how is knowledge acquired? Which is epistemology. And so you're not really supposed to use a word like epistemology either this early in a talk or this early in the morning. So <laughs> sorry about that. Bear with me. But epistemology is, of course, the branch of philosophy that deals with the study of knowledge. Like, Asking questions like, what is knowledge? And how is knowledge acquired? And how do we know what we know? Like, this is kind of deep and heady stuff. And when you're thinking about this, you also think, OK, well, the, you might think, well, I don't really do epistemology. I write demos. But when you're writing demos or tutorials, your audience has epistemic goals. Basically, they want to know stuff. and we tend to actually, you know, this slide is supposed to be a joke, but it's actually one of those, it's funny because it's true jokes. Because sometimes people in our audience have possibly unreasonable epistemic goals, right? They want to be very good at everything. Mm -hmm. And our response as developer advocates is often, well, I can teach you how to do it. I've been trying to figure out, like, how I could represent, a, like, orally this particular kerning and I can't I haven't got it right yet like you know I can teach you how to do it but there are a few problems with this like we think oh yeah I can teach you how to do that but who is the you and what do we mean by how and what is it and answering these questions correctly helps us make sure that we are setting and achieving the right epistemic goals for our audience. And also, this means that if you get tired of calling yourself like DevRel or a developer advocate, you can now call yourself an applied epistemologist, <laughs> which I highly recommend. And so when we're thinking about the who of the I can teach you how to do it, we often think of developers learning in like three channels, like school, right, or work, or people who are self-taught. And we say self-taught, but that, in my opinion, I really like to say community-taught instead. Because people who are learning like web development, for example, are not like sitting down and intuiting how to build a web page from first principles, right? Like they are learning from demos and tutorials and conference talks. And of course, there's a lot of overlap in these channels, right? Nobody learns just at school, and nobody learns just at work, and nobody learns just, you know, by tutorials. And Thinking about these channels can be helpful when we're thinking about the who, but I think it's important not to use them as an excuse or a way to like shift responsibility. Like you shouldn't be thinking, oh, well, you should have learned that in a formal CS program, or you don't need to worry about that until you're on a team that's doing production deployments, or, you know, oh, there's tons of tutorials on this particular topic. You can go look at one of those, right? When you're thinking about the you, you want to really think about like what can you bring to them and not what they should have learned somewhere else, because should, should is meaningless. You can't say should to someone. So if those are the, the possible yous, what's the it? I'm just going to assume that whatever your it is, it's a good idea, and that it's something that people want to learn. So I'm going to leave aside it for the moment and think about the how. And when you're thinking about fulfilling people's epistemic goals, that's where you get sneaky. Your user really has two goals. 
The first is that they want to learn whatever X it is, whatever it it is that you're writing a demo for, or showing a tutorial of, or talking about. How to use loopback, for example, or Docker, or your API, or what a monad is, or anything that you're trying to teach people. And the second thing, the, the second thing that they want to learn, the second goal that they have, is they want to learn how to be good developers. And if you just show them whatever technology it is in a vacuum, you may fulfill that first goal. You know, they may walk away learning what a monad is, although frankly, I never have, no matter how many times someone has tried to explain it to me. But you might not get them any further towards their second goal of being a good developer, because they're just learning one tiny little thing. So how do you help your audience make progress towards that second goal? Um, there are a couple things that you can check for in your examples, and I'm gonna talk about three of them today. Uh, salience, prototypicality, and mapping. So salience. A salient feature of something is something that's noticeable or important, even though it might not be essential to something's functionality. So you could drink your coffee or tea out of a blank mug, and it will taste just the same. But a salient feature of mugs in Western office culture is that they have funny sayings on them or brand identifications because you want the user to be able to display some facet of his or her personality. So you might think that leaving out a salient feature in your example makes things easier, but it's the equivalent of sending your developer into a new office with a blank mug. A, a big example of this, and one that I am personally guilty of, is showing demos that build APIs or sites with user information, but leaving out the authentication step, right? Yeah, of course, your thing works, but authentication is a salient feature of APIs, and so, a hint that you've left out something salient is if you say don't do this in production in your example, you're probably missing a salient feature. And the problem with that is that no matter how many warnings you give to people, and no matter how wrong you think something is, and no matter how many times you warn them not to do it, they will do it anyway and they will get mad at you. And honestly, it is kind of your fault because you said, you know, don't do this, knowing that human nature is that they're going to do it. And often, if they don't know enough to know not to do the thing, they, they will ignore your warnings because they don't know what the consequences are. So if you leave out salient features, that can be a problem. Um, so prototypicality is kind of related to salience. So if I ask you all to think of a bird, very few of you will think of an ostrich. Because an ostrich is not a prototypical bird. Usually when people are asked to think of a bird, they think of robins or sparrows, depending on where they live. And an example of demos and tutorials that are not prototypical is writing demonstration functions that do simple mathematical operations. That is not really a prototypical use of functions outside of textbooks. How many people write a function when they want to do simple math? Nobody. I never write a function to do simple math. I use Apple Spotlight to do simple math like Steve Jobs intended. <laughs> so when you're trying to show a technology, you think, what do most people, what do normal people, what do people in the real world use this for? That's usually your prototypical example. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about in terms of examples uh, is mapping. Mapping is just making sure that you help your audience understand where a particular technology fits in their mental map of how things work. When I have time in London, the best way to, to learn London is obviously to walk it. But when I have time in London, I like to take the bus instead of taking the tube. Because when I take the tube, I actually don't have any idea how the place where I start my journey and the place where I end my journey are connected. Like the tube map is a very abstract map, and so I'm like, oh, I got from A to B, but I have no idea like, what kind of tesseract folding had to happen in the universe to make this, this you know, journey happen. And a bus ride lets me stitch the neighborhoods together, because I'm overland, I can say, oh, this is where this neighborhood turns into that neighborhood. And uh, it's easy, or I think it's easier to do this in our examples than we think. We don't have to show something isolated. We can talk a little bit about how this fits into the universe of things. Uh, for example, I saw a really good demo 
um, a Lunch and Learn, actually, sponsored by the San Francisco team about Kubernetes a couple weeks ago, where the presenters spent a lot of time comparing and contrasting virtual machines and containers and clusters so the audience had a better idea of the relationships and the trade-offs involved. So salience and prototypicality and mapping are all kind of implicit information about the universe of code that you probably know, but that you can make explicit when you're building demos and tutorials. So really, these things help you think about, like, what does the, de the developer, what does the audience that you're talking to need? And they need examples that include these things. And also, I believe that it's the law. If you say the word need in a presentation, you have to then show Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, from his 1943, A Theory of Human Motivation. And everybody's seen this pyramid before, right? Like, this pyramid is like a very pervasive and, and contagious meme. Because once you have this pyramid, you just want to like expand it to every single domain. So you might want to build one for coders that looks like this, right? Um, probably it looks more like this. <laughs> um, but this layout is kind of deceptive. Like this pyramid is deceptive because it makes you think that you can just like climb the ziggurat of developer knowledge one step at a time and it's okay to stay stuck at a particular level. Like I'm just gonna talk about, I'm just gonna give you the Wi-Fi password then we're done. Or like I'm just gonna talk about code or I'm gonna like spend a whole bunch of time talking about tools and treating them as different levels. Um, and there's a lot of content that reinforces this idea. Like obviously like epistemic proof through Google is not really like that valid, but come on. Like there's a lot of this. And um, it can be really boring to learn things this way because it's harder to memorize a list of random numbers than it is to learn an equally long story. And I think it's often really hard to go from those lists to real knowledge because you lack context. And this is the most context-free image I could find on Flickr. What is going on here? I do not know. There is no knowledge around this photo. Like, I have no idea what's going on here. And sometimes those lists make you feel the same way. Like, what? So maybe instead of a stepped pyramid, we want something like this. So think about like when you're running a demo or a tutorial, you're not stepping up. You're like taking a core sample. You're gonna drill through all these layers and your tutorial is gonna have a slice of each of these layers. And some slicers may be thicker than others, but all of them should be included. And because, so maybe right now you're saying, uh, like, okay, nobody says, I'm gonna teach you how to make a sandwich, but we're gonna start by just eating a slice of turkey to keep things manageable. Like, that's, that's not how sandwich making works, right? And nobody says, okay, well, we're just gonna focus on the theory of sandwiches. I'm not gonna mention hot dogs here. I'm not gonna mention hot dogs here. But, okay, I'm gonna briefly mention hot dogs and sandwiches. Um, so my proof for sandwichness is if someone says, hey, can you pick me up a sandwich? And if you bring them back something else and they don't punch you, then what you've given them is a sandwich. Like, that makes sense, right? Okay, but anyway, like, the temptation can be to focus very low level, like, of that pyramid on the code, or very high level on the theory. And this is one of my favorite t-shirts of all time because I am an alumna of the University of Chicago. So basically like, well, that works in practice, but how does it work in theory? Um, and the thing is, is that if you focus too much on theory um, and ignore the practice, that's equally bad because it is entirely possible, as Michael Polanyi said, to understand the physics involved in maintaining a state of balance but still be unable to ride a bicycle. And that is the, like the downside of focusing mostly on theory. But you may be saying now, Aaron, I cannot possibly include all this in every tutorial and demo. And that is true. You have to pick and choose. You have to decide which of these layers in your core sample is gonna be the thickest. And that's because, as uh, George Box, the British statistician said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And he also said that the ability to devise simple but evocative models is the signature of the great scientist. So perhaps all tutorials are incomplete, but some are useful, and the ability to devise evocative tutorials is the sign of the great developer relations person. But how do you decide whether a tutorial is like usefully incomplete? Um, did anybody have this toy as a kid? I'm really old, so probably you don't ha ha remember this. Um, this was called Dapper Dan, and it was not like a super fun toy. 
Um, they don't make it anymore because there's no way that this competes with like YouTube on an iPad. But um, it's basically a getting dressed tutorial for toddlers. It had buttons and zippers and shoelaces to tie, and everything was functional and salient and prototypical in the right relationship to one another. It was well matched. You couldn't zip the pants after you buttoned the vest, like trousers. You couldn't zip the trousers. Um, and <laughs> anyway, this obviously this is an incomplete tutorial, as anyone who has ever tried to teach a toddler to put on his or her own socks knows. But it was very useful. And so thinking about like how to make a useful tutorial, I, I think of this model like, does it have everything that you need to know? Is everything in the right place and in the right relationship to each other, even though this is not complete, right? There are no hats, you know, there are no socks. Um, but the last way I want to talk about how to satisfy your audience's epistemic goals is um, by being a role model. Uh, basically, every time you give a demo or a tutorial, you have opportunities for teachable moments. Teachable moments is actually the term of art. Um, that's really what they're called. I once worked on a reading textbook, and I had to write a bunch of teachable moments. And I can tell you from experience, it is a lot more interesting to think about teachable moments for software developers than it is to think about teachable moments for second graders. As much as I love long vowel sounds, teachable moments for software developers is way more fun. Um, and there's a lot of pedagogical research that shows that if you teach skills in context, and this is a slide I totally yoinked from Flickr because lots of teachers talk about this and they share their slides, um, the things that every developer should know are often disconnected um, from, the from tutorials. But to be really effective, you should teach these skills during your demos. And so there are a couple different ways that you can do that. One of the things that I love to do is I love to show keyboard commands for editing the command line because life is too short for backspace. So like, you know, by going option left, you can delete a word to the left. Control E will take you to the end of the line. Control U will kill the whole line. And this is something that you can do very easily when you're in live coding, and it's a way to implicitly show how things work. Um, this is actually a twofer because at the same time, you can talk about how to modify your shell prompt. I use ZSH uh, or oh my ZSH, and uh, also using something like NVMRC. So every time I switch into a new directory, I have an <coughs> NVMRC file that tells me which version of Node I should be using for a particular project, and it switches it automatically, which I think is pretty awesome, because the fewer things I have to remember at my advanced age, the better. So um, another thing that I love to model is uh, using little tools like clipboard managers. How many people here use a clipboard manager? Yay. Um, I'm often surprised by how many people don't use a clipboard manager. I think they're super useful. If you don't use one, try it. You'll like it. Basically, it lets you save your copy and paste history for like ages and bookmark certain copy and paste fragments. Like you might use a macro expander like text expander to do the same thing. I use something called copy and paste. Um, you might think that everyone knows all this stuff already. No, they do not. And in fact, the, the idea that most people don't know what most other people know is one that has a long history. Like Piaget was talking about this like decades ago. He says every time somebody begins to teach something, he finds out that, oh my goodness, nobody in the audience understood me because I didn't know what they didn't know. And there's a lot of epistemological research that shows that you are very likely to overestimate the extent to which a random other person's knowledge mirrors your own. So you tend to think that other people know exactly what you know, and they do not. In fact, this happened just the other day on Twitter, right? I actually have a Unix sysadmin certificate. I have a piece of paper and everything. I like sat through an entire course on Unix commands. I didn't know this command. People overestimate what other people know. So don't hesitate to show off things that you think are useful, that make your life better, that you think help make people good developers. So one of the other things I want to talk about is when a, a good way to model expected behavior to developers is to show what you do when you make a mistake. 
Now, obviously, when you're live coding and the demo gods frown on you, all you want to do is like recover from your mistake, get back on the happy path. But showing how to troubleshoot and how to debug when things go wrong unexpectedly is hugely valuable. And it's something that a lot of developers like take a long time to learn. Um, so when you make a mistake, like, you know, go deep. <laughs> like, just show what you did wrong, show why it's wrong, show how you figured out that it was wrong. Like, one of the things I do over and over again is I will have too many node processes running at the same time, and then I get like an error no ent. I was like, oh, yeah, I can't run another version of loopback because I already have a version running on the same port, and it doesn't like that. Um, so explaining that kind of thing to developers really helps them. I do want to point out that this can be problematic, especially if you are an underrepresented person in tech. Because if you screw up, even if you screw up on purpose to show how to fix things, there's a chance that other people will use it to reinforce their stereotypes about who is a good developer and who is not. And that sucks. So just be aware that like, you might think, oh, I made a mistake and now I'm gonna show people how to recover, that there might be people who think, oh, she made a mistake, she's terrible. So, another thing that sucks is tool shaming. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Everyone has preferences around tools, and it can be hard to give a demo without standing for a tool that you really love. But it's better to say, I find this tool helpful, and it helps me do X, Y, and Z, and not all good developers use this tool, right? So don't shame people for the tools they use, just show the tools that you like. And if your tool is really great, by example, you will show that it is better. Um, it, come on, it's hard to make demos. Tutorials are time consuming to put together, but you can get more bang for your buck or heft for your brick and achieve more of the epistemic goals for you and for your audience if you incorporate teachable moments, if you give full context, if you think about salience and prototypicality and mapping in your examples and your demos. So one of the other things I learned while working on elementary school um, reading programs is that if you sit through an entire, if, if you sit quietly while the teacher is speaking, you get a sticker. So if you want to come up to me afterwards and get your semicolon appreciation sticker, I will give you a sticker. Um, <laughs> I have lots of these to give away if you want one. Uh, if listening to me talk has made you think that I don't want a sticker, but I do want a new free tier IBM Cloud Lite account. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with no expiration date, you can sign up one here free with this link. You can have both an IBM Cloud Lite account and a sticker. Um, but I hope that uh, your epistemic goals have been satisfied by this talk. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And um, you can reach me on Twitter. I also would like to thank the fine people of Flickr, fewer and fewer of them every day now, who openly license their images. This whole presentation is CC by NCSA. If you would like this set of slides to give a completely different talk using these same images in the same order, I'm happy to share them with you. So thank you so much.